world is changing fast. New technologies are impacting how we think about products, services, and the way we live our lives. Nowhere is this trend more present than in financial services, where new business models and customer expectations are changing our conceptions about banking, finance, and the very nature of money. Welcome to Rebank, a visionary podcast about banking, fintech, and the future. The future of banking is here. Hello and welcome to Rebank. I'm your host, Will Beeson. Today we're thrilled to be joined by Charlie Dellingpole. Charlie is the founder and CEO of Comply Advantage, a company using artificial intelligence and machine learning to help prevent financial crime. Prior to founding Comply Advantage, Charlie co-founded and ran Market Invoice, a leading alternative lending platform focused on invoice finance. Charlie founded his first startup in 1999 and somehow managed to run it for seven years while at Cambridge and then the London School of Economics. As always, connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, or on our website at bankingthefuture.com. If you like today's show, please subscribe on iTunes or your podcast platform of choice and leave us a review. Thank you very much for joining us today. Please welcome Charlie Dellingpole. Charlie, welcome to Rebank. It's great to be here. When people ask you what you do, how do you answer? So, um, Comply Advantage, um, we are a AML and CTF screening platform. So, with an API or with a case management platform, you're able to accurately screen and then triage a customer base to see who's high risk and who's not. So, for the sake of clarity, AML, anti-money laundering, CTF, counterterrorism, finance. Exactly, yeah. yeah. All right. But you must say more than that, right? You're also a serial entrepreneur. You started Market Invoice. Yeah, so um, this is my third company, I guess, um, over the past how many years. I've done a variety of things. The first company was The Student Room. I started that when I was about 16, which was, in fact, kind of 10 different companies in one. Um, I then did, um, back in 2009, I left J.P. Morgan and did the Market Invoice platform. And then in 2014, I started Comply Advantage. The student room, is that, was that a tech play? Was it digital, was it online, was it different? Yeah, so I guess when I was 16, um, my mother was very good friends with um, Kevin Lomax, who started Mysis. So I guess from a very early age, I'd like interned in financial technology companies. I taught myself how to code. Um, and I guess um, I had a decent understanding of a variety of different companies. So in terms of fintech, um, back in 2009, um, I was JP Morgan, and fintech as a concept didn't really exist then, right? It was, as far as I was concerned, it was invoice finance, right? So um, what we were trying to do was trying to take a reasonably dusty, unknown area of the financial market and try and change it for the better. And then um, at the same time, it transpired that Funding Circle was launching, Crowdcube was launching, and you had all these different platforms that were launching at the same time and had the same kind of idea. I guess the genesis of that was that in 2009, the banks weren't lending, um, they were very dysfunctional, and people saw an opportunity to try and step into the breach and really improve what was happening in the financial landscape there. So yeah, I mean, FinTech itself, to an extent, really evolved in that kind of period whereby simultaneously people saw an opportunity to try and improve what was happening in finance. Yeah, I'm I'm really curious just on a a personal level. Do you view yourself as a fintech entrepreneur, a fintech specialist, or do you feel like you've simply identified opportunities in the market which happen to be in fintech and you've uh, managed to take advantage of them? Yeah, so I guess technically, Again, the same thing happened this time. So back in 2014, um, this wasn't considered fintech and also this notion of regtech didn't exist. But now in the past like two years after I've been doing it, it's become regtech, right? So now you have all these meetups and conferences and decks on regtech, which is regulatory technology. So support services to financial technology. So, but with the same aesthetic of cloud-based machine learning, algorithmic, um, Python-based platforms. So yeah, I mean, what we're doing now isn't, you can argue to an extent that RegTech is the subset of FinTech and both are to an extent FinTech to the extent that they're financially related. So both companies, I guess, were are B2B, so market invoice and 
and now comply advantage. Do you think it's a fair characterization? Exactly, yeah. So, I mean, I guess both companies, what we were trying to do was help other companies. So um, both were bricks and mortar plays rather than being principals themselves. So um, to an extent, if you're trying to decompose the value chain and assess in advance whereabouts you want to be, I mean, I'd much rather be a, a less capital intensive play that didn't rely upon huge investment and could accurately scale without consuming too much capital or investment. So in theory, both both platforms are kind of less capital intensive B2B plays. And both companies are also, or both business models, if market invoice regulated to an extent, I imagine in the sense uh, that it was extending credit or, or coordinating credit and a comply advantage, the current venture operating in a highly technical, highly rules and regulations, laws based area, would it be easier? Would it have been easier to be operating in a completely unregulated space? Or do you think it's actually the kind of structured nature of those industries that, that allows you to create a competitive advantage? So specifically on the point with regards to the regulation around market invoice back in 2009, there was no regulation surrounding specified investments, specifically invoices or high net worth individuals. So there wasn't any regulation. Um, additionally, around peer to peer finance, there was no regulation. So all the regulation really kind of came up after that point. Um, with regards to what we're doing now in, in terms of by advantage and the whole reg tech space, what we have to understand and then address is the broad diversity of international regulations around money laundering, terrorist financing, um, and those are very, very broad. And one of the reasons why this company should exist is because they are very complex. And if you're a fintech company, you want to try and grow your client base, you want to be able to not go to jail. And therefore, by having a single company that focuses exclusively on that particular part of the day-to-day -day processes, we think we will do a much better job than any other company would do themselves. Mm -hmm. So I was at Mark and Invoice, the MRLO. So I would have gone to jail had we done anything particularly bad. Tell us a bit more about Comply Advantage. I mean, uh, so what types of customers do you have? What does the platform look like? How do customers engage with it? Yeah, so um, the company now we're nearly 70 people. So we have offices in New York and Romania and London. Um, and yeah, so um, we've raised about $10 million. In terms of client base, we have, I guess, in terms of companies relying on our platform, over 200. And then a significant portion of those are direct clients. So um, in terms of specific examples, many I can't necessarily announce, but I guess we announced yesterday the partnership with your previous guest, Nigel Verdon from Rails Bank, and there Nigel is allowing some of his clients who will have to mitigate the risk of terrorist financing to use our data and platform via Rails Bank. So um, he, he's embedding the information that we are providing in his platform. So just thinking about the dynamics of it to help people understand, it is a database, or at least a component of it is a database that allows users, companies in this case, to identify politically exposed people, to identify people that may have criminal histories that, that may be more likely to potentially be financing terrorism or, or otherwise kind of pursuing nefarious behavior. Is that the idea? Yeah, so the actual core concept is very simple. The regulatory elaboration of the different forms of that are quite complicated, right? So at its core, you can't deal with bad people, right? And you can't help bad people. Um, what that means in practice is um, Donald Trump doesn't like Syrian scientists making chemical weapons, and he doesn't like Iranian scientists making weapons with nuclear elements, right? Um, so what we're trying to do is allow banks or financial institutions who have to process huge client bases or high volumes of payments to accurately triage and be able to stop any payments or clients using them who might be considered bad. Mm -hmm. And so is this, I don't know, an, an API-based kind of uh, component of a workflow that automatically gets, gets pinged to confirm the 
the, the, the status of a specific sender or receiver of payments, or is it a database with, with an inner, you know, searchable interface that, uh, that back office people at banks or financial services companies would use? Yeah, so the kind of broader system is comprised of many different components. Um, the kind of main um, disbursement mechanism or ingestion mechanism for the data is either our preference is the API or via a kind of CSB ingestion process or via a case management platform. So, and all of those three different ingestion points all feed back in the same underlying database and again be used to triage and then monitor the different elements of the platform. What were the early days like? How did you go from idea to revenue generation? So I guess in terms of the broader genesis of the company, um, I left Market Invoice and I came up with 20 different ideas and sectors, um, asked various people, um, did kind of reasonably broad analyses of different spaces like debit cards or Bitcoin or, or all these different areas. and. Lots of my friends who were still Jacob Morgan, they complained about how bad compliance was. So I went out and I talked to people in this compliance space and obviously I had some experience of the compliance space because I'd been MRLO Market Invoice and I spoke to various companies and the first company that we worked with um, sends um, X billion dollars a year to Somalia, Afghanistan, Pakistan. So very, very high risk um, in terms of the transactions that were occurring and what we did for that company and still do today is re-architected completely the entire platform so that they can accurately assess whether or not the money's going to your uncle or to Al-Shabaab and that's interesting because in terms of access to finance, in terms of people being able to feed their families, there's a very important moral case for them still being able to access their financial system. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Without that first client, it would have been very, very difficult to be able to build the company. So, um, and also, at least for us, that provided the incentive and reassurance that what we were doing was valid and there was demand for it. And also, at the same time, it gave us a very good insight into the day-to-day -day operational challenges and tasks that the MRLOs and financial crime professionals face in this industry. So. Um, it was only by doing a ethnography of the precise day-to-day -day tasks and how you can accurately manage the false positives and financial crime risk and, and being able to speak with the Treasury, um, the HMRC, the National Crime Agency and being able to meet with them and understand their problems, um, which otherwise would have been impossible, that we were able to understand how we could then solve these problems. How did you connect with that first customer? So the person that was sent to us by Barclays from Mark and Invoice, it was an ex-policeman, and his job was to go around and understand and help these particular companies. And he came in to help us at Mark and Invoice with our questions and understanding of the different financial crime risks that we had there. So I had direct experience and had met him through market invoice and he was happy enough to introduce us to 10 different companies or so. What has the customer response been like to your proposition? How successful have, have you guys been so far? I guess we took it very, very slowly. So I think what we're building is very, very big. So in terms of the kind of investment in sales versus technology, the vast majority of the investment has gone on building the underlying platform. and we deliberately restricted the amount of sales and marketing that we did until we felt that it was ready. I think partly because the, the underlying scalability and robustness of the platform are, are very, very serious. So what we're building isn't a social media site. What we're building is absolutely fundamental to our clients and therefore has to be extremely robust. It has to work. Otherwise, people go to jail and they're very serious ramifications. So. Um, we invested very heavily in the platform and very slowly in the sales and marketing. So I think only now we're we really beginning to start selling the platform in any kind of real scale. Um, now that we feel that we're ready to take it to market. So, but I think in terms of reaction, we obviously built it around the needs of the clients and we spent lots of time asking them what particular nuances that they 
felt were important or what particular strategies or techniques were we um, capable of delivering which could help them better manage false positives. So even though we've been going a decent amount of time, um, we know because people have told us that the reaction is positive because we built it around their needs. And what's, what's, the, what's the reaction of heads of compliance, MLROs, when, when they first see the platform? Is this, oh my God, this is going to change my life. I've never seen anything like this before. Is it, this will be helpful uh, sitting alongside other tools that I use? How do, how do people generally think of it kind of off the bat? Yeah, so I guess what you see in the space is that lots of processes are inefficient and bad. And if we can go in and say, listen, beforehand, you were maligned by receiving 100 false positives every hour, whereas now you're only receiving 10 and therefore your, 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 your workload has decreased significantly, then that's materially better for the people and therefore they can switch from dealing with the more menial tasks to tasks which are much more investigative and interesting and really use their intellectual capability. So I think the reaction is very positive, particularly where we can meaningfully re reduce the number of false positives that the clients experience. KYC and AML and counterterrorism financing regulation is extremely strict. Do you think the regulation is appropriately designed to deliver on its intentions? Yeah, so um, the answer to that is, I think the kind of broader um, framework around CTF, AML, and the kind of tools and practices have to be considered as a broader process and structure. So if the question is, has what's here now accurately solved and mitigated the risk of factual crime money laundering, the answer obviously is no, right? So the problem hasn't been solved, right? And the technologies and systems and processes haven't worked and therefore the incumbents have failed, right? And therefore we need, we need a much better new solution. Um, Obviously, FATF and HMRC and NCA are working to address these issues, but the only reason that this company should exist is to try and solve those problems. And if they're solved already, then we wouldn't be here today. You would know the statistics much better than I would, but don't, don't they show effectively that you know, we invest billions and billions in AML, CTF, and the amount of financial crime that's actually stopped is, you know, a fraction of a percent sort of thing on, yeah, on, exactly. on an annual yeah. basis. I mean, what, what's the, does that suggest that we're totally falling flat on the efforts that we're making? Does it suggest that a certain amount of financial crime is always going to happen and there's just very little we can do? Yeah. So I think the reason why, at least for me, this, this problem is interesting is because it's so hard, right? As in, if you're a terrorist or money launderer, then your options are very, very broad in terms of how you want to try and get rid of the money, right? So you can choose to go buy Bitcoin, you can choose to try and inflate the value of invoices, you can try and buy paintings or artwork. So the options are very, very broad and therefore the kind of range of solutions and different tools needed to counteract those problems are also very Broad, right? So, and also, I think in terms of the technologies available today, which weren't available 10 years ago, I guess the kind of broader vocation for what we're trying to achieve is to at least have a go at seeing if what's available now can accurately help us to mitigate the challenges. So, the point is to try and solve the problem because people haven't been able to do so in the past. Would you agree with the view that laws and regulations in this area will only get more complicated going forward? So, I would disagree with that particular viewpoint. I think um, you have instances or parallels in different industries whereby you have the capture of the agency which regulates the industry by the industry itself. Um, and you have to also view that history itself isn't necessarily a kind of process driven, end of history style teleological journey, as in, as with Brexit, all these things whereby there might appear to be some sort of underlying trend or some sort of process, that isn't necessarily the case. So I think if you look at the Wolfsburg Group or at any large international banking lobby, those banks have strong interests in terms of reducing their cost base, increasing their profits. Whilst CTF legislation is quite emotive and it's very easy for politicians to come down hard on banks, I wouldn't underestimate the lobbying power of banks themselves to have their interests adequately addressed. If 10% of your cost base is spent on the manual processes around compliance, then at some point the banks will think, actually, I prefer not to do this. 
as you saw with Dodd-Frank or with different areas of legislation around lending, right? I mean, with lending, you see every 20 years boom and bust cycles whereby the credit limits are relaxed and therefore people lend more and people don't necessarily learn their own lessons, right? So I think potentially morally, people might be less accepting of people who are bad, but I wouldn't necessarily say that that would translate into much tighter legislation. Are there any lessons from your experience starting and growing Market Invoice that you were able to bring to, uh, to Comply Advantage? Anything you did differently this, this time around? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I, mean, I think in terms of the kind of choice of market, I think finally this, this company is very international. So we have teams in Romania and New York, which is lots of fun. I think in terms of the client base, again, it's kind of very, very broad. Um, in terms of the underlying economic model, it's um, kind of SaaS, cloud-based. Um, in terms of the team, it, you know, it, it's always a cliche that the, the most important thing in the company is the team, and therefore we fought very hard to attract and retain the best people. Um, yeah, I think the lessons from Mark and Invoice definitely suffuse like every choice we made in the past three years. So you've you've. You mentioned that you're now kind of getting to the point where the platform has been suitably built following great investment and, and painstaking development, and you're now kind of flipping the switch in terms of sales and business development. So how do you think about scaling? I mean, what was, what was the experience at Market Invoice, and, and, and what's your early experience now? I mean, going forward, what, what will Comply Advantage as a company be doing differently compared to what it's done to get here? I think the key issue around scaling is the kind of CAC LTV arbitrage, right? In terms of the, the kind of cost to acquire a user and then how long they stay and how much they pay, right? So um, to the extent that revenue solves all problems, if you're able to pay a salesperson because what they're bringing to the table in terms of the client base is sufficiently valuable, and in terms of core client maintenance, if it's sufficiently intuitive, then it doesn't require a kind of material customer success overhead, then the scalability should be implicit. Um, so what we've architected in terms of the sales function has been replicated already in the US as well as the UK. So um, in terms of establishing different pods, um, in terms of the kind of technical scalability, so I think one problem we face is just the sheer volume of server costs. So um, because of the, the, the volume of information going through the platform, the amount of data being crunched, um, hopefully, if we can adequately refactor the, the code base to make it less costly in terms of the AWS burden, then I think we should see scalability happening reasonably easily. This is an interesting topic, and I'm sure that a lot of the, the audience will get um, some helpful kind of insight out of this conversation. I mean, um, you talked about revising the code base now to make it more efficient. With, to, to what extent was writing clean, efficient code early on part of the strategy? To, to what extent was it, let's just get something that works and uh, you know, prove market traction and then we can revisit later? And in your experience, what are the pros and cons of, of those two strategies? Yeah, so I guess in the immediate instance, the specific refactoring we're doing is, is moving things from um, instances to containers. So on Amazon, you have this Elastic Compute Cloud, and then you want to move things into containers via the Elastic Compute Service, and then move things from serverless over to things like Lambda and have much more serverless architecture because the instance cost for spot instances is, is roughly 10% of the overall cost. So if you can refactor the code base on AWS, then potentially rather than paying 100,000 pounds a month, you're paying 10,000 pounds, right? And that's, and that's a huge saving. On the broader point, you're completely right. So you want to try and launch a minimum of our product and then try and iterate through that. I mean, and that's since, since Stephen Blank, that's been orthodoxy back in 2008, right? So I think the kind of analogy for that is if you're evolving an eye, you start with a light sensitive patch of skin and then you have a retina and you have like a ocular socket. And you know, so it, it simply evolves over time. And what we've seen as well is we have kind of 15 different internal teams and services and platforms and all those are constantly evolving, right? And I think the kind of go-to-market strategy is as important, but probably less important than the kind of technical strategy. So what we're doing here, we have a 10-year roadmap for, right? In terms of 
the kind of number of ideas and, and, and processes and different areas we want to invest in and improve. So what we're building now is very much kind of only kind of 5% of what we want to build. No, it, it's actually a, a point that I'm personally fascinated by. You start new companies with the, rather one starts new companies with the intention of building the best thing possible. You, as you say, start with kind of an iterative approach, uh, minimum viable product, confirm traction to you know, effectively prove that there's an opportunity, attract the necessary resources and, and scale from there. I think one of, the, one of the biggest challenges though that people maybe aren't necessarily thinking about on day one is the fact that, okay, once we get to say, I don't know, one, two, three years in, and we've got something that works, that has a, as you say, perhaps not perfectly efficient cost base, but that some people are using. Uh, we've got focuses like generating revenue, perhaps building a sales force. It can be really difficult in poorly managed companies to actually go back and make those fundamental yeah. core changes to get to the you know, version 2.0, whatever it is, uh, proposition that's gonna take the company yeah. from year two to year 10. How, how do you as a founder and, and manager of this business think about that? In terms of technical strategy, if you have a legacy platform and, and, and you're trying to migrate onto a new platform, that's very, very challenging, right? So um, in that respect, you have to avoid things like forks, you have to stay on a single code base. The analogy is the ship of Theseus analogy or the kind of the sugar babes analogy, right? Because you have this pop band called the sugar babes and apparently um, one by one, each of the sugar babes left, right? And then they are replaced by, by a new band. And then um, the old group of four then reformed. So if, effectively, you have two separate groups of a pop band, both of whom could claim to be the right pop band, right? So that analogy works to the extent that if you've replaced every single component of a system, is the system that you now have actually the same system as that which began, right? So what you have to avoid is these kind of big bang updates whereby you suddenly shift on day one over to a whole new platform, right? So if you're a bank and you've acquired all these different platforms, then you have by default 10 different platforms. And therefore, if you want to try and compete with an upstart fintech incumbent who, who, who's coming to the market, then that's very challenging, right? So yeah, I think lots of different companies often don't have someone who's necessarily making those calls and yet those calls are critical to the success of the company. Well, and interesting, it sounds like the budget needs to be there from, from day one, i.e. You know, expecting, for instance, in the income bank example, if yeah. you're buying five new uh, yeah. you know, small, small companies all with their own technology yeah. and at a certain point you need to kind of invest to integrate that into one functional platform. Yeah, exactly. If you budgeted for it, you can do it. And if yeah. you haven't, then you've kind of misrepresented the, 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 the ROI and the investment you're making. Yeah, so in terms of the technical debt which can kill a company, I think it can be very, very obvious if you look in a particular industry and you see a technology which hasn't been updated for kind of 10 years, but still has wide distribution, and you talk to people and there's evidently a very low NPS score, I think in those instances, it's kind of extremely obvious that there's a big opportunity there, right? Um, I mean, but then you, can't, you, you wouldn't necessarily want to underestimate the extent to which there are switching costs or entrenched systems or networks which aren't necessarily obvious. So yeah, I think those kind of, those kind of vestigial symptoms of a really screwed underlying technology should be an incentive to try and assess to what extent those should be replaced. What will success look like for Comply Advantage a handful of years from now? So if you gave me another like 100 million pounds, I could very easily spend it on doing lots of cool stuff in the space, right? So I'd really love to have like 10 people just working on Swahili. I'd love to really love to do all these different improvements and systems. I'd love to have an office in Asia and stuff. And, and, and hopefully if the client reaction is sufficiently strong and people like what we're doing, then we will find ourselves to get there, right? So in terms of fulfilling the promise of what we're trying to do and take what we're doing to its logical conclusion, um, yeah, I, I think in terms of the number of people we want working on the platform and the number of clients we'd like to have using a system, yeah, it, what we're doing is a very small portion of what I'd like it to be. 
Thinking about fintech more broadly, what are the most interesting trends you're seeing play out in the space? Yeah, so um, I guess one of the spaces that I kind of follow is this whole prepaid debit card space. Um, and I guess I was in Berlin last week for this ACAMS conference and then the week before that in Prague and Warsaw. So I guess just, just seeing this kind of broader pan-European market and the different nuances that are available in there. So I guess going to Germany, you see that with Deutsche Bank, they have these gyro cards rather than actual MasterCards. And then going to Latvia, you see that there are huge fees for disbursement charges and there are lots of different niches in this kind of retail B2C debit card market. And the extent to which you have Holvi or Number 26 or Monzo coming around and, and Revolut. And every single day you see a new entry into this market. I think that particular space and the amount of capital going in and the amount of innovation happening and the amount of the amount of marketing spend going in is yeah as an observer that whole space is interesting to see how it plays out the impact upon the incumbents um the new innovations happening the, the kind of different models in terms of distribution of insurance whether or not their strategy is dependent upon them being an app with material dwell time yeah that particular space i would say is interesting before we go i'd like to ask you a few rapid fire questions what are you most excited about right now and why? At Comply Advantage, in FinTech, or, or beyond? Um, so I think in terms of excitement, probably the particular nuances around the AWS instance that we have. So in terms of the kind of raw number of services that we consume, in terms of the different architectures that we can use, in terms of the processing power and the different tools. Yeah, I think the, the kind of infrastructure that we're able to use and the technologies that we're able to use and hopefully the, the kind of reduction in costs we can see, there's lots of potential there. If you could do it all again, what would you do differently? Yeah, so one of the investors in Market Invoice said of my first company, you could have won the Olympics. Instead, you won the school egg and spoon race. So like, you know, if you've been doing this stuff since 1999, right? And in that time, companies have been built like Facebook, like Google, like all these companies now worth hundreds of billions of pounds, right? Like then all those opportunities were missed, right? And I'm sure today there are companies being built which are going to be huge hundred billion pound companies, right? So yeah, I mean, I guess I, I would have preferred to have started Facebook rather than like the machinery, right? <laughs> What advice would you have for someone considering starting a company? Um, I guess the cliche advice is probably also correct in terms of have the best team, ask for help, um, read all the orthodox material and blogs that are out there. I mean, 10 years ago, there wasn't much information out there for people, whereas now there's a huge amount. So in terms of support, in terms of this podcast, in terms of information advice people don't beforehand, you have vast amounts of information. And so there isn't really any excuse for not using it. What's your approach to raising third-party capital? So having done it at Market Invoice and having done it now, we raised money off Bolton and um, we worked with Tim Bunting and Saranga very closely and they've been great in terms of the advice they've given us, in terms of the feedback, in terms of the kind of mentorship. So the advice that I give is choose your investors very, very wisely because in many respects, it's like a marriage it isn't really a kind of distant relationship because in the end, you're both very closely related in the same cap table. So it isn't transactional, it's, it's a very long-term thing and you want, you want guidance and alignment with people who, who are smart and who have done it beforehand rather than people who claim to be an investor and don't really know what they're doing. Will Comply Advantage be your last company? The way that I conceive of this is if you look at Amazon, right, then that isn't a single company. When Jeff Bezos started Amazon, he wasn't the be all end all will be books, right? It's, um, it's a holding company for everything he's doing. Um, what I'm doing now, I love doing, right? And hopefully I can carry on doing that for a long time. And hopefully I can carry on doing that within Comply Vantage, right? hopefully we can carry on having new ideas and new projects. Um, whether or not it's called Comply Vantage or whether or not this holding company is a thing within which I, I operate, 
hopefully it will be, um, but irrespective, hopefully I'll, I'll kind of carry on doing what I enjoy until I die, right? Charlie, what's the best way for people to find out more about your work and connect with you directly? Yeah, so the website is called compliveantage.com. My email is charlie at compliveantage.com. And yeah, we have a Twitter feed. All right. Charlie Dellingpole, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Will. Thanks for tuning into Rebank. If you like today's show, reach out. Follow us on Twitter at Rebank Podcast and join the conversation. For more on banking, fintech, and the future, check out our regular content at www.bankingthefuture.com.